Hello, my name is Matthew Weber. Welcome to the UX and Data Meetup. Today we've got Steve Wexler, and I just want to tell you a little bit about how I found Steve. Um, and uh, he is going to be talking, he has, has a great presentation for today. Uh, but do you mind if I talk about this book for a second? Because I'm a big fan of the book. The, the, the what author? No, I, I, please don't. The last thing I want is more people knowing about the book or buying more copies. Okay, great. All right, thank okay. you, Steve. So, yeah. uh, so I teach a class at Columbia that at some times is a hard class to teach. The name of the class is called Analytical Applications and Data-Driven UX. And as you can imagine, the data that most people make analytical applications about is not data that everybody wants to share with everybody else. It's stuff like banks and like what, what are, how's performance of the company doing? They're not the types of applications that people want to share with other people outside the company. So this past week, you know, we had one of the students had said, hey Matt, um, can, you, uh, can you show us more examples of work out there? And I said, well, it's really hard. And that's why we've got this book to show within the class because it has so many great uh, uh, different case studies of different types of, well, you'll call them the dashboards, and I'll sometimes call parts of them analytical applications. So many great uh, examples. Um, so for this last week, we were just doing something with Bloomberg for their Data for Good conference. There's a chapter on, um, on confer uh, conference app. There's another chapter on mobile applications, another case study. Uh, a few months ago, we were doing something with JET and Net Promoter Score. There's at least two different chapters on, I think two different chapters on Net Promoter Score. It seems like any, every other project we were looking at, there were examples in here and wow. So I, as I was evaluating the, the book before it even was published, I reached out to Steve and we were chatting and I said, hey, you know, I, I run this meetup. You seem to live in the New York area. Would you like to come in in June and tell everyone about your, about your meetup? And he said, Yes, so that's the story of how Steve showed up today. Very excited. Um, he's got some, some great stuff to share with you today. So let's get a warm round of applause for Steve Wexler. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So before I get started, just a few questions. How many of you are involved at all with um, having to take data and turn it into the, the visualized data so other people can see and understand it in some context? Okay, this is good. Um, how many people are doing that just for internal purposes? It's like this is going to be some stuff that other people inside the company need to see, understand, and act on. Okay, how many people are doing it for, gee, this is public, this is going outside, this is other people are going to be looking at this stuff. How many people um, that would say that they're, what they're creating borders not so much on analytical dashboards, but more on infographics? Okay. We're, we're more on the analytical dashboards and not so much on the infographics, but we'll talk about the allure of trying to make stuff uh, really sexy, et cetera. Um, so most of what I do is um, involved with business dashboards and helping people. I'm going to co-opt um, the motto or vision statement for a tool that I use called Tableau, uh, help people see and understand their data. And one of the things that I see people doing is they're thinking, okay, this is not the most interesting stuff in the world. I need to make it look frigging fantastic. I'm going to dress it up. It's going to be just so alluring. People are going to want to spend time with it. And that's not really a great idea. There's how do I make the data more interesting? If it's not inherently interesting, well, there's a famous fellow. I'll see how many people know who he is who has a good quote. And I had a lot of trouble finding this quote, and I'll explain why in a minute. That is, if your numbers are boring, get some interesting numbers. If you get some interesting numbers, you may learn something interesting. How many of you have heard of Edward Tufte? Yeah, he's written like the you know, seminal work, the, quanti uh, the Visual Display of Quantitative Information, 1983. The reason I had trouble finding the exact words is I knew it was on a tweet, and I went to f you know, find the tweet. He has banned me from following him on Twitter. I'm thinking, and apparently he's banned a bunch of people from following him on Twitter. And I'm, you know, this is like, you know, I'm, this is like the Donald Trump of, 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 of data visualization here. He's banned me from doing this. What, I'm not that important. I'm not that well known. What did I do? And like two, three years ago, I wrote, wrote this um, blog post 
called sparklines, schmarklines. I don't know if you've heard of the, what a sparkline is. He kind of invented this chart type. It's like, a, imagine a whole collection of little EKG-like type of graphs. And it, it really wasn't insulting Tufty. It wasn't insulting the notion of it. It was just people were using it where it probably shouldn't be used. In any case, I guess he got wind of it and he no longer allows me to follow him on Twitter, but there are a bunch of really great badasses that he doesn't allow to follow him on Twitter, so I feel pretty good. So let me come back also with this whole notion of, gee, you know, that really isn't engaging data. Let's make something a little more interesting. So I want to um, show you what was a really, really bad data visualization challenge from someone who should know much better. This person was looking at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, annual report. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does incredible work. I mean, this, you know, th this organization has billions and billions of dollars, and, they, and most of what Bill Gates is doing with his Microsoft millions is, er, billions, excuse me, is, is lending it to charitable pursuits, and one of which is the eradication of malaria. This person was looking at the annual report and stumbled across this. Anybody know what this is? It is your basic, has to be in the annual report balance sheet. Not only does it have to be in the annual report, it has to look just like that. This is inherently not really fascinating stuff, but if you're curious about the health of the organization and what this year versus the previous year look like and what the assets are versus the liabilities, here it is. This person's idea was, you know, let's see if people can make this more interesting. And, and, un, and this person started with, and here's my take on this. Right? And this is such a bad visualization. First of all, the height of this, that's 43 billion. But over here, it's only 692 million. So you're thinking this compares to this. Also, look at this steep slope. It went from 692 to 688. While, while over here, hold on, we're gonna see something that goes from, this is a narrow slope, and it's going from 114 to 840. My reaction to this was, oh my God. No, it goes beyond that. This is so bad, it approaches Fox News level type of uh, uh, graphic. No, the, 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 I'm not saying all Fox News things, but, the, but my co-author has like a collection of 20 graphics from Fox News that are like this, okay? And if I'm not looking at the number, I'm just looking at the size of the bar, I'm going, wow, we've only got four days and we have so far to go. Well, that's because the bar actually starts down here and they didn't even bother to label the axis. That's evil, that's in purposely deceptive. Here's another one, which is if Bush tax cuts expire, they go all the way from down here 35% to, oh my God, this bar is five times as much. It's going up to 175%. No, it's going up to 39.6. These are examples of what somebody, I wish I had come up with this, calls them turds. Truly unfortunate representation of data. But, but part of this is kind of this allure of, gee, I have to, it, it, um, uh, it came from this need of, I need to take this thing and make it look more interesting. And I'm, I'm wondering, why are you even doing that? In the case of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, there's so much really cool stuff in that annual report. Why do you even want people looking at the balance sheet? Why are you creating something which is more distracting? And I had a client that kind of had the same thing. This is a distillation, a much simpler version of a demographics dashboard from a survey that was done by a big global consulting firm. 3,000 survey respondents. And one of the things they wanted to show was who took the survey. Not what they thought about stuff, it's just who took the survey. And so here's a, a fine, straightforward, super easy to read, um, demographics dashboard where I can see the difference, you know, the percentage of men versus women, the percentage versus people of different generations, the percentage of people who live in different countries, and so on. The second year of the survey, they decided, gee, you know, we want to make something which really brings people in, which is cooler, which is more engaging, and they made something that looks like this. Okay? And, and, and look, it is going to draw you and you're going to go, ooh, that looks kind of like a Mondrian over here. And I don't know what's happening over here, but, but, but we've got 
you know, you know, millennials are this size and Generation X is this size and baby boomers. And oh, I've always wondered, what do you call the generation before the baby boomers? And one term for them is tr traditionalists. I don't know what's up with them, but they're clearly very angry. And, and, then, and then you have this donut chart over here. And the only way you can know that there are more men than women, because there's no way you can tell that this, the size of this arc is bigger than the size of that arc. So thank goodness the numbers are there. This, within the parlance of uh, the book, uh, gets designated a screaming cat. I'll explain. How many of you have you know, purchased books on data visualization? Any at all? How many of them have bad, you know, at some point in the book, someplace, the author is saying, is presenting an example of something they don't think you should do? You know, so you're reading, you, there's something in the book and they're saying, here's a bad idea. The problem is, I'll pick up these books, I'll be thumbing through it, I'll see a graphic and I'll look at something and think, does the author want me to make this or is this something I should avoid at all costs? And we wanted people to be able to pick up the book and if they see, well, that's not good, I'm sorry, I find it really hard to pick up midstream. Hi, I'm Steve Wexler. And I'm the, <laughs> all right. The, the issue with the case of that, that screaming cat and this desire to make the demographics more interesting was that, look, that's just not interesting data. Or is there something that you can do to put a spin on this? And specifically, is it the context of the data? So how do news organizations try to make stories interesting? And I know you, could, you can think of a dozen answers to how they try to make it more interesting, but I'm gonna um, bring up sort of a somber notion for the moment, which is if you hear about uh, a train derailment in a foreign country or a plane crash in a foreign country, some plane has crashed and there's a reporter mentioning it, so they'll say, this happened, it happened this morning. What is the next thing that's going to come out of the reporter's mouth, most likely? How many Americans were on board? And if you are living in France and a French plane crashed in Algeria, it will say how many French people? Because you're trying to put it in some context that you can identify. So that, that there's this focus, how are we going to make this meaningful to the person who's watching our show? And so what is it that interests people? Well, it's, it's, it's themselves. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't mean we're all narcissists. Um, it's I can't feel and believe to the same degree for everybody on this planet. But they're, they're trying to put something in context that I can relate to it and care about it. Well, maybe you can do that with data. All right, so I'm going to evoke a, a famous icon from the 1980s in New York City. And I would imagine, okay, how many people recognize this man? Okay, how many people under 30 recognize this man? Okay, this was Mayor Ed Koch. I believe he was the mayor for eight years, and he had a certain catchphrase. Anybody remember what it was? How am I doing? Thank you, Bill. How am I doing? Exactly. And I have realized, you know, I didn't kind of give my pedigree, pedigree or street cred about dashboards. I have made thousands of dashboards that people don't use. More dashboards than anybody I know that they haven't used. And it was, why aren't they using it? And it was, what can I do to make it about the person who's using it? So here are a whole boatload of questions, which is, you know, how much older or younger than I am than others? How is the store I manage performing compared to others? How did my session compare with others? How is my salary compared to other people? As opposed to just average salary of people in different parts of the country? No, I want to see how I'm doing. How common is my birthday? Not terribly common, by the way. And how much will I save if I use a generic drug? And, ooh, the survey. You know, that demographics survey, the boring thing, which was just a bar chart, so let's make it look really sexy with um, a tree map and, a, and, and, and packed bubbles. How did people like me respond to this survey? Hey, if I can see that and see there are a lot of people like me, I might be more interested in it. So this is a histogram or a distribution of, from the, from the uh, U.S. Census showing how many millions of people are of a certain age. And the way to read this is there are 
uh, roughly four million newborns. There are slightly more people who are one years old. There are you know, that many 40-year-olds, et cetera. Um, and I actually find this interesting. Um, most of my friends and family, not so much. But if you're a data geek, you in fact do find this interesting because you look at stuff like this, which is, you know, you see this big bar here and then suddenly it drops down. Okay? Yeah, okay, what, what, you I want to know what that is. I, I immediately see something like this and going, whoa, what happened? You know, why, why aren't these bars kind of going like this? What happened with this drop off? I don't know the answer. I can give you two possibilities. One is um, baby boomers. Yeah. You know, you had a new generation. The other possibility is you hit retirement age and then you die. Okay, so bo both are, are, you know, the, part of what a dashboard is supposed to do is, is have you ask more questions. You now understand the basic profile, demographic age profile of the United States. Now you want to know, well, why did that drop off like that? What caused that? If you change this and instead make something like this, and we're going to play with this a little bit later, um, this allows you to move the slider and put your age in and see how much older or younger you are than other people. And suddenly you get a sense of the data. You just go, oh my God, I had no idea I'm 40 years old. I'm older than half of the United States. It's really, did, did, I'm gonna do this to press the crap out of me as you'll see when, 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 when we play with it in, in, in a little bit. But you also start doing not just yourself, but you know, your spouse, your kids, your parents, stuff like that. It really gives you a great sense of it. Here's another example of something which has really resonated with different companies where I've done this, which is um, I'm a store manager. I want to know how my store is doing compared with the other stores. I can't know. So th this is me. That's my dot. I'm the lovely teal dot that's in the middle in these places. And you can't help but notice, wow, my store really sucks when it comes to convenience, but we seem to be doing pretty well overall cleanliness. Hey, ease of moving about. Well, we did a great deal of work to make the aisles wider and things like that. Um, people want to know how they're doing, how they're performing, how they're doing better. And it's anonymized. You know, I, I, I don't know who the other stu what these other dots are. I just know where my dot is. By the way, this is almost like a, a form of gamification. You want to see how you're doing, how, you, uh, uh, um, how you're progressing over time. You want to see your dot versus others. This is um, from the Tableau Speaker Conference uh, a number of years ago, and we have speaker ratings, and where people could type in and see. So each of these dots is a different session, and a person would put their ID and they could see how they did compared to others. And then this person did really well, and they were 25 out of 105, 77th percentile. Oh, they did really well in content, speaker presentation, not so much in relevance. And people use it, they want to know. This is a really cool feature over here. It says resize by response count, so you can see the size of the dots. This is called a jitter plot, by the way. It's a strip plot with a jitter. So instead of having all the dots on top of each other and doing a, um, a box plot type of thing, you can kind of see how the different things skew. It's an odd thing that happens. Uh, if we have time, I'll show you. If you decide to resize the dots, you, you, if it's a really small dot, it means only like five, six people reviewed the session. If it's a big dot, 150 people reviewed the session. It looks like champagne flutes. It looks like champagne bubbles. So you're trying to add this additional information, but actually kind of distracts a little bit. Um, Here's the same thing, but instead of showing all the dots, it's here is a, an individual speaker, and here's how they compare against the average. And for me, at least, this gives me a much better sense of where this speaker is within the universe of speakers. I get the sense of how many other speakers there are. I see this, and I go, OK, I did pretty well. Well, how many people did better than me? I can't see that. How many people did worse than me? Well, I can see, on average, people did worse. So. There, there are other ways to do this, by the way, it's, but it's th this, here's me, here's everybody else, really grabs people. Um, this is, I'm just showing this because it's one of my co-authors. This is from the most recent conference, not two years ago, and it is showing um, average session content rating on one axis and average speaker presentation rating on another, and oh my God, who is that orange dot in the upper left? upper right corner, that's Jeffrey Schaefer and Andy Kriebel. Jeffrey is one of the co-authors. Yes, I am one of the large dots in the upper right-hand corner, but I was not the biggest, largest upper right corner thing, and we won't identify who that is. Um, here's another thing. that This is right out of the book, 
but it's a um, course metrics guide where I'm sure if um, Matt and, and, and Kim and others at Columbia were to do something like this, they would see that how incredibly well rated their courses are. It's allowing this person to see how am I doing. In this case, this person didn't have the individual dots. So they're just saying, here's me and here is um, the other people that teach the same sectional and then the college as a whole. They didn't have, um, it, it would have been a more compelling had it been disaggregated data, but this is what they had. Um, this is a fun one that I have up on my website, which is salary data, an example, and, and where you can type in your salary and see here's your dot and here's everybody else and lower quartile, et cetera, and whomever this person is, they're very sad at the moment because they're way down here in the lowest percentile, but if they type in a higher number, the icon changes as it moves up. Um, a friend and colleague and fellow tello, uh, Tableau Zen Master built this years ago, how common is your birthday? And where you can hover over this and see what is the, out of the 366 days that you can have a birthday on, the deeper, darker the red is, the more common it is, or orange is, the more common. And needless to say, uh, February 29th um, is gonna be the lightest color there. It obviously only happens once every four years. The other uh, thing that astute people will notice is, boy, there seem to be a lot of people born in September, and they start doing the math and wondering, well, what happened nine months before, oh, New Year's Eve? Okay, I get it. So th that type of stuff happening with it. Um, Here's another example where there was a, um, about generic versus name brand pharmaceuticals in the UK, and it would allow people to look at the drugs they cared about. You know, if I just do a generic thing comparing, a generic thing comparing generic drugs, uh, comparing um, all drugs with name brand drugs doesn't mean so much. If I'm looking at the ones that that I use or my kid uses or something like that, I suddenly become way more interested in it because it's, it's personal. It isn't about this general problem that's happening. So there are some things that are gonna compete and that I wanna kind of discuss various design pressures that may be on you besides the personalization. So I look at this spectrum that I see in front of me at the moment, which is, um, this dashboard, this analysis, this thing I want to create that I want people to use and learn from, who is it for? Well, if it's just for me, who cares what it looks like? Then you've got, um, oh, just a small work group. I've got a department um, executive level. You've got to get more and more sophisticated. If you're creating something that's customer facing, it's got to look great. Everything's got to be right. It's got to have all the right colors. The logo has to be in the right place, et cetera. But, I rarely compete in this space, which is the, gee, I need, to, you know, I need to have some reason for you to come and look at this thing. Everything else was about some type of business. Someone is using this to run their business or doing something. This is, you're stumbling across a web page or looking at the New York Times or USA Today or whatever it is. Why do you stop and read that page and not another page? So most of my work and what I'm involved with and what this book involves with is dashboards that inform, enlighten, and engage. If you're making something which is for public consumption and you don't, they don't have a reason, you have a much harder pressure, you've got to attract the people first. You've got to have the pheromones in, the, uh, in your data visualization. Then you can inform, enlighten, uh, and engage. So that's one of the things that, that um, you know, I just don't have to deal with that challenge because every, most of the things in the book are about there's a business purpose, people have a need for this thing as opposed to how do I attract them. The other thing that is informing everything I'm doing is what is gonna, um, oh, I'm, gonna I'm gonna deal with this person first. Michelle Borkin, um, have any of you heard of her? She's done some early research into what makes a visualization memorable. You know, what is it that will attract people and they will recall it later? She's been beaten up a little bit because she only surveyed 33 people and it's still early research. No, but she's like the first, you know, but you know, eye scans and testing these people, it's, it, it is a good, I'm putting a stake in the ground. First person who's done anything like this. 
And here's one of the things she discovered. So if you have this pressure of, I have to attract people from the outside, titles and text are key elements and important in a visualization. People will remember, you know, if you've got something catchy, as opposed to just demographics dashboard, but instead you say, 90% of the people are from the United States. You know, something, make a statement, it seems to work. I'm gonna show you a pretty famous infographic that it came out about five years ago. Any of you seen this one before? Okay, it says, top 10 most read books in the world, and you see the Holy Bible and the quotations of Chairman Mao, and then gee, what comes next, Harry Potter, and it eventually works its way down to the diary of Anne Frank. I have not tested the source of the data, but someone made this cool visualization. Here's the thing, if it had just said this, people wouldn't have remembered it. When they did a test afterwards and said all these different graphics and said, what do you recall? And said, oh yeah, the top 10 books. Uh, yeah, I remember that. The first book was the Bible and the second book was something by some Chinese dude. And, and people remembered it. Now, this is a pretty alluring graphic, but I would have to give this a screaming cat. And I'll explain why. So here's our little screaming cat icon. This is the real graphic. That's the baseline. They, they printed a lot of free Bibles that used to be in every hotel room. And that's why there are 3.9 billion copies of the Bible circulating and 820 million copies of Chairman Mao. So that's the baseline and the graphic designer did put that in there, but it just looks way cooler to have the book spines reading things. But you don't, that's not the way you take it in. That's like a Fox News graphic. So you gotta, you gotta find a way to do both. That's great, you know, you go back to um, this version of it and you have the top 10 most read books in the world and something that looks cool, but it is a misleading graphic because of that. I've wondered about this, by the way, this idea of a catchy title or some things like that, and I've tried with my own blog post and things like that. I really want to do a blog post or something that has something like this. By the way, that's absolutely true. I wouldn't feel bad about it. If you don't read this graphic, you will die. If you read the graphic, you will die. I mean, it's, 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 and it's not saying you're gonna die imminently. It's absolutely true. And I, I just wanna see if, if it will attract people, um, if I will get more traffic if I have this incendiary type of title on the graphic or what I'm doing. Um, have any of you read Kathy Sarah's book, Making Users Badass? especially if you're in, in user experience. This is a great book. I read this before starting on my book and it changed the way I approached everything I did about writing blog posts, about teaching, about preparing for, for this. It's more about people don't care so much about being great at your the particular tool or, or, or uh, whatever service it is that you have. It's more what they can do with it. But I synthesized that and was thinking more and more about um, what is it that audience is, uh, want to see? What is, what is it that I can do that can make something that's helpful or meaningful to them? And I'm now doing this in everything that I do, even down to um, when I do a full day course on something. You know, here is a typical you know, agenda slide. I hate these. You know, and the person says, okay, you know, we'll have breakfast, then we'll work on the fundamentals of database design, then we'll take a break. Here is the same agenda, but keeping what the audience wants to see in mind. And that's, that's, you know, <laughs> and, and yes, it's got kind of a tongue in cheek type of thing, but I'm more and more trying to, to think about what is it that they need. And it's one of the reasons I'd ask people what your focus was. I'm glad that there are not too many people trying to make uh, badass infographics that are really sexy and attractive because I'm not particularly good at that. Um, so let's go back to our problem here, which was the boring demographics dashboard. How can I make this something which is actually helps people? I don't want, and in fact, if I were to do that Mondrian and the pack bubbles and the stupid donut chart, I will alienate people. They'll spend two to three minutes because it looks shiny and cool and they'll start trying to parse it and they'll go, I didn't learn anything from this, this is a waste. If instead I were to do something like this, which is ask people 
um, hey, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? And then I, in the data, can reflect uh, what's going on in the data. So, um, oh, I'm, well, stretch of the imagination, I'm a, uh, uh, a woman baby boomer from South America. And then present, oh, okay, woman baby boomer South America, there are 36 people just like you who took the survey. And maybe you want to filter these results so you can see how, or, you know, what were their opinions like, because maybe that's a good reflect, you know, a similar reflection on what would appeal to you. Biggest problem one of my colleagues has with Yelp reviews is she wants to be able to filter the reviews not by young people who give high ratings because the portions are really large and the food is cheap, but for other things. So, hey, can I just, you know, can I, f you know, filter the results so I just see results by middle-aged white guys, you know, on, on Yelp and something like that. So th that's what we're trying to put in play here. By the way, there are a few, a handful of things that we can do to possibly make this um, um, a little more alluring. Um, that, that isn't going to um, uh, tarnish the quality of the graphics. Instead of a bar chart, you can do something that's called a lollipop chart. Just a thin bar with a circle at the end. And it looks a little more attractive. Um, I got beaten up by Stephen Tufty about this, but I can handle myself. Uh, um, Stephen, excuse me, not Edward, Edward Tufty and Stephen Few. Um, is saying that, gee, you know, you're, you're, you're by, by not having a clear endpoint, you're making it hard to make an exact comparison, but it's pretty easy for people to judge the length of the bars. So this is something that you can possibly do. And let's play with some of those dashboards and just uh, interact with them and see how the personalization works and how it gives a lot more meaning to stuff. Oh, and then we'll come back to the plug for the book. And I will be giving a book away to somebody. So, and there will be a little test. I'm going to show a dashboard, or I'm going to show a visualization that has a problem with it. And if you can tell me what is inherently wrong with the visualization, you know, and, and, and there is something that is fundamentally you shouldn't do. And it isn't like, gee, you know, I broke the axis and I have a big bar and a small bar, and they're really not big or small. So I will show you that, and if someone can tell me why they think it's wrong, they will get a free copy of the book. But let me change this, so I'm going to be interacting, and I've got to duplicate the display, so give me one second to do that. Okay, and I think you can see my screen. And it's exactly the same thing I have on my screen. And give me one second to queue this up. Nope, wrong one. Here it is. I'm going to show that the um, The are you over the hill in the USA? This is, you can just go to datarevelations.com and play with this. All right, who would like to volunteer for this and find out just how much older or younger you are than other people in the United States? Do I have any, by the way, you know, if you're 23 years old, it's like this is not a painful experience. If you're more, if you're more of my vintage, this is, uh, can be a little painful. Any, do I have any volunteers here? Willing to uh, say, give their age? Go ahead. You're, oh. <laughs> Oh, God, wow, you're really going to, 22, so let me move the slider to 22, and let me change this, gee, I just want to look at, you are, you are older than 30%, um, or you are younger than 70%. Someone said, you know, you should change this to, are, you know, are you younger than, when, whether you are older than, to have anyone else that wants to uh, try this? Okay, I will be the, um, uh, uh, Okay, we have this set for, I'll set it for all, 
and I'm going to put this at my age, which is 58, and this bummed me out. I am older than 77.5% of all Americans, and in fact, it gets worse. If I go to men, I am older than almost 80% of America. And I look fantastic, don't I? <laughs> the only thing that gave me so great solace was, oh, wait a minute, my brother who's been lording over me since we were kids that he's five years older? <laughs> okay, let's have some fun. Hey, Rick, guess what? You are older than 85.3% of male Americans. Um, my daughter Diana is here. I didn't tell her I did this. I was kind of discussing this, and there was one of, um, I go to the gym, work out in the morning, and then I hang out with the Altacockers, the older guys who are there, because I work out of my house. I don't have to be in the office most of the time. And, and these people are like, are of my parents' generation. And one of them, you know, they saw this and said, oh, try that with me. I said, no, 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 you really don't. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I really want to see what happens. So, you know, he's 83. And he was so bummed. He said, I'm older than 98% of, I felt terrible about this. So, um, that's that example, and you can play with it to your heart's content. Uh, let me find some other stuff for us to play with, and I'll take, then, then we'll take some questions, and then I'll... So this is the speaker rating thing, where you can put in, hey, what is my... Uh, um, you, know, you put your speaker ID in. So I'm speak with speaker number 317, and you can see how he performed. And just to show you what it looks like, if you say change the size of the dots, doesn't that look like champagne bubbles? So I find it a little harder to read, but that's not the only way you can show this. Here's another way of doing it. That's called the unit histogram. So you can get a real sense of, okay, that's my dot. I'm a 4.6 over here. I can see there are a few people, and I can see a lot of people rated my session. The key thing is getting a sense of where am I within the, uh, the universe. And let's see if I've got anything else that's worth uh, showing. Um, by the way, the reason for the jitter is here's your dot and here's everybody else, and they're overlapped on top of each other. And what a lot of people do is a, is a box plot. People who look at my stuff do not understand how to read the box plot. Box plot is the middle thing here, that's the median, upper quartile, lower quartile, and this is one and a half times the interquartile difference. This was developed by a, uh, John W. Tukey, and it's a really cool way to show this. By the way, does anyone know why he came up? Why, why is the distance from here to here? You know, why is it one and a half times the interquartile? And, and apparently a student asked him, and he said, ah, one time is too small, two, two times is too big, one and a half seems like the right number. So re remember that the next time somebody says statistics are, are exact. Um, we'll play with one more thing. <laughs> Oh, here's the birthday thing, if you want to hover over your birthday and find out what their, you know, the ranking is for it. So, you know, my birthday is November 10th, so if all of you are greatly appreciative of how this has helped you, um, I would like a Tesla. So my rank is 182 out of 366. Obviously, February 29th is ranked last, but you can see all these different dates over here and how popular they are, or how, you know, the ranking of birthdays, and you can see here are the top 10 and bottom 10, and the top 10 birthdays are all in September. Question. Yeah, I guess, you know what? Yeah, look, you, you spotted something immediately, okay? Which is, man, wait a second, why aren't there a lot of people born on July 4th? And, and, and it's because, it's, man, none of the doctors are around, they're all way on, just hold out, honey, we don't want to be doing this now. Great, great eye for that. That, by the way, the, you know, that's a good visualization when you're saying this really density, great density, and I hadn't noticed that before. Nice eye on that thing. We'll play with the, um, uh, the salary item in this. So I'm really sad because I only make $28,000, or, or, and that is putting me pretty far down on the list here, but you know, I got a new job and they seem to appreciate me a lot. And, Oh, I'm still a little sad. Well, wait a minute, I got a, got a... 
oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit better now. Uh, gee, you know, I just want to compare myself amongst men. Okay, I'm doing all right, but, you know, gee, how about men? All right, well, now I'm kind of bummed out. Um, but wait a second, I got this fantastic new job, you know, I learned these new skills, I learned data visualization and how to engage individuals and, 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 and how to personalize stuff, so now I'm making $150,000 a year. Hey, and look at me, I'm Mr. Monopoly. So, um, but this type of gamification will get people involved with what you're making for them and they'll understand the data and they're going to constantly want to improve and see where they are with that. So that is just some good examples of it. You don't need to make flashy charts. You just need to figure out how to personalize stuff. And with that, are there any questions? Um, you were uh, favoring Tableau, um, but is there any uh, open source uh, uh, visual data libraries that you think are uh, good alternatives? The, the, the Tableau is, is, if you are a student or if you use Tableau Public, it's free. Probably D3, but as, as anyone else have something that they use that's open source, is free and does a, a good job? Although certainly Microsoft Excel, don't they kind of issue everybody a copy of Excel when they're born now? Is that, is that something that, that, no? Okay. Other questions? Sorry. Real quick, if you have a question, please wait for somebody to come to, to you with a microphone. Because there's, there's a massive throng of people dying to, uh, you know, uh, pick my brain right now. One more, at least, there we go, thank you. And please wait for the person to bring the microphone. Um, so do you have any preferred way to visualize more qualitative information, like text responses, things like that? So um, two type of... Um, um, of, of qualitative thing. Most of my work is around visualizing survey data. And if you think about what a Likert scale is, and by the way, it's spelled L-I-K-E-R-T, but it is pronounced Likert, even though it's that way. The guy's name was Rensis Likert. Um, not too many parents naming their kids Rensis these days. Um, well, that was an attempt to create a quantitative measure to qualitative data. How, um, how important is this thing to you? Not important, a little important, uh, important, very important, unbelievably important, and doing a scale of one through five. If it is open text data or sentiment data, you're going to need something that does the text mining and comes up with the common things and does the sentiment analysis. And I don't do any of that. I do the visualization of that after the mining has been done. Anyone have any good tools that they use for the open, you know, the, the open text response um, uh, normalization of the data? There are a whole bunch of tools out there, Rapid Miner. What do you use? Anything in particular? No, we do. Oh, that's painful. By the way, it's really hard because all the different words that might um, uh, be used for something. You know, the, the, the um, gee, I really like something, I love something, uh, I adore something, and, and all the, you know, the synonyms for things like that. It's, it's a pretty complicated problem. You need sophisticated language tools. The, 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 I, maybe. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Question over there. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, if I think about dashboards as I work with them now, um, there's tons of different sections of categories of information that are just sort of laid across the page, right? And they're, they're different in the way that uh, you would want to take a deep dive into any one of them. Um, but if you're trying to get an overview of something, that's really the, way, the purpose of the dashboard, right? A lot of information laid out on the page. Yet, the personalization parts that you're calling out here actually make me want to drive interactivity in the tool, right? Use it more, spend a lot more time on it. And so I wonder if every section of the dashboard had that ability, it'd be a little bit of overload, um, and not, it seems not, like what you're saying is choose the stuff wisely? No, well, it's certainly choose the stuff wisely, right. and we could, we, could, we could talk for hours about this, sure. but um, I'm not going to try to uh, um, bring the example up, but I'm thinking of one of the examples in the book that comes to mind is a Net Promoter Score dashboard, and it would be... Uh, net promoter score is where you're asking people what they, uh, oh, you know what, you should know what this is. So when you're at a restaurant or something and you see this question, you're going to know that's a net promoter score question. So 
one or two years ago, I'm out with my wife at the Culinary Institute of America. If any of you been up there, um, it's, it's where they teach chefs to be great chefs. And, and they're all students that are doing this. And we had a wonderful meal there, and they had this card there and said, would you recommend this restaurant to a friend or colleague? And it was something that went from zero to 10. And my wife said, hey, this is really good. You know, I, I'd give it an eight. I said, no, 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 give it a nine. No, an eight's really good. I said, no, an eight's neutral. A nine or a 10 is a promoter. And a one through six or a zero through six, you're a detractor. She said, wait, you mean a seven and an eight means I'm neutral? He said, in net, in net promoter score land, yes. The way you get the net promoter score is you take the percentage of people who chose a nine or a 10, they're called the promoters, you subtract the percentage of people that gave a zero through six, and you multiply by 100, and that gives you the net promoter score. So there's something with the net promoter score, but a really cool way to show it. And it's for all these different companies. And then you drill that, you click one of the companies, and you see what the breakdown is for, for, for uh, different job titles. You know, maybe uh, physicians love the stuff, but uh, engineers hate the stuff. And then you see, well, how has the thing changed over time? The way you make the thing personal, this is a long answer to your question, is you highlight the person's company so they can see how is my company within this thing, within this drill down, doing against all the other companies. So at the top level, you're always showing here's you, here's everybody else. You drill down and, and do the comparison, and you're saying here's my group and here's everybody else. Which one is it? Any other questions? Okay, shall we do the, uh, the book giveaway? Okay. Um, look at this. This is, this is an Excel spreadsheet. This is a text table. This is a cross tab. And this makes it really hard to find interesting data. Look, I want you to look at the combination of product subcategory, which is going down here, and region, and find which region, and people in the back, there's no way you can see this stuff, which combination of region and product subcategory is doing best, and which one is doing worst? Anyone, anyone ready to make an assertion? Say, I know which one's doing best. I know which one's doing worst. I've looked at all uh, 68 cells. It's 4 by 17. OK. Go ahead. Um, binders and binder accessories in the West is doing the best, and bookcases is doing the worst. Binders and binders accessories in the West doing the best, and bookcases doing. No, I'm sorry, you're paying for the pizza. Oh, what a shame. Okay, Kevin. Uh, doing the best uh, office machines in the South. Okay, hold on. Where's office machines? I, uh, down at the bottom. Office machines in the. Ooh, 129,060. Ooh, I'm getting tingly. Okay, and which one's the worst? The storage organization in the Central. Oh, no. I'm ashamed. You're paying for the water. Okay, all right, oh, um, over here, the guy who asked the good question before. Office, office machines in the South is doing the best. Right, we already heard that. Okay, that was the easy one. And where's the so furniture tables in the East? Tables in the East is doing, that's right, it is. Tables in the East, is the, you see something worse? Uh, storage and organization in Central. Storage and organization, I'll be excited if that's the case. Storage and organization in Central. And central is only minus 68. You're, you're way in the back, so you're, you're it, oh, that's a negative number with the parentheses around it. You were looking at the, uh, yeah, the negative numbers are in parentheses on that. That was my, that's, had I had a minus sign, I would have made it clear. You're absolutely right. Had I done this, okay, this is called either conditional text in Excel, Tableau calls it a highlight table. I call it the gateway drug to data visualization because people see immediately, they get all excited about it. Not only you can see, wow, that's really bad, and that's really good, but you can see tables suck in three out of four places, and you couldn't see that before. The only reason this isn't a great visualization is I can see it's bad, I can't just see, I can't make an exact comparison. That's why I use a bar chart on this. But this, this is good. By the way, apparently, this, is, this data set has become so popular over the last 10 years, there is a band in Seattle called Tables in the East. <laughs> I kid you not. Okay, here's the thing, and, and, and you can call out, okay? D Diana actually knows what the problem is with this visualization, so you, you do not get the book, okay? Yeah, I know. So uh, you, some people may know immediately, I'm gonna show you another version of this highlight table, but there is something inherently bad about it.
What's wrong with this? Yes, you get a copy of the book. Eight percent of males suffer from red-green color vision deficiency, and it means that cell and that cell look indistinguishable. The really bad one and the really good one look the same. There's a really, you can pick up the book, there's a great colorblind simulator, because it's not just red and green, it's other combinations as well. And then you can have your image, you can load it into the simulator, and it does an incredible job of showing you what this would look like to someone with color blindness. And that's what it looks like to someone with color blindness. Mm. Right? Which is, any, any of you um, football fans? Any football fans here? And, wow, man, that's, that's, that's the end. I, I am so shorting my stock in the NFL. Um, the, the, there was a game last year between the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills. Anyone know about that game? Yeah. So it was the Thursday night game and the NFL was doing these like brightly colored uniforms. And so the Jets were in this bright green, and you know, all top to bottom, bright green. The uh, Bills were bright red. And colored black people were like, who's doing They could not, it looked like, it looked like the Browns against the Browns. And it was impossible to tell what was going on. But that's not a small number of people. You know, one out of 12. This is not an insignificant, you know, I'm not talking about one out of a thousand or something like that. So, bravo for knowing that. Enjoy the book. And I would like to thank Workbench and thank Matt in particular, but Kim and Bill, thank you so much for having me here today. This is a blast. Oh, and if you want to follow or any of that type of stuff, here you go. So, there's a website associated with the book, and that is my Twitter handle and would love to hear from you. So thanks so much.